Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. As usual, we are going to have a great show today. We have a great guest who's wrote, written a very important book, Dr. Brian L. Title of the show today, Dr. Brian L. Ott will discuss politics by Twitter and then pharmaceutical legal fraud continued. Dr. Brian Ott will discuss in detail how Twitter has affected our politics and how it will evolve going forward. And then the second part will be a continuation, the pharmaceutical pilfer win insulin continues now folks on yesterday's show i made the case that in the insulin story where pharmaceutical companies are pilfering the american people is just one cog in a system that prevents most americans from accumulating wealth in the second segment we will discuss or we will continue that discussion and don't forget tonight is politics done rights first video meetup I hope to see you there. Those of you who are subscribers on Patreon or uh, contributors through PayPal, remember that tonight you should have already received your email with a link telling you how to get into the, uh, the, the, the chat, the video chat that we're going to have, the meetup that we're going to have. If you didn't get that email uh, and we made a snafu somewhere, please remember to drop an email to info at politicsdoneright.com, info at politicsdoneright.com. But today we have another special guest. He will open many eyes on the state of Twitter politics. Twitter politics, you know, when you have a book. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, look, Dr. Brian L. Ott is an award-winning scholar and teacher who has been studying rhetoric, communication, and media technologies for more than 20 years. He has authored numerous books and articles on the changing nature of communication in the digital era, and he regularly presents his research at public events and professional conferences. He has held the rank of professor at three different institutions, Colorado State University, University of Colorado, Denver, and Texas Tech University. Red Raider, and you know, I'm, an, I'm, I'm orange, as, uh, burnt orange as you can go. Dr. Ott is the <laughs> former department chair of communication studies at Texas Tech and the current director of Texas Tech University Press. Ott has been featured in publications such as the New York Times and is also the author of The Small Screen, How Television Equips Us to Live in the Information Age, Critical Media Studies, An Introduction, and The Twitter Presidency, Donald J. Trump and the Politics of White Rage. Don't I want to get into this conversation, not only because it's a burnt orange against that red, 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 red raider, Dr. Brian L. Ott. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing fabulous. Thanks for having me. Well, absolutely. So, look, uh, folks, we had everything set up for a live coverage, and we don't know. There must be a firewall somewhere that kind of messed with the Internet communication. But, you know, we got the next best thing. What we wanted to have is Dr. Ott to uh, sort of tell us a little bit about, um, about the, his new book. So, uh, before I even get started, what brought you to Texas, my friend? So I was at the University of Colorado Denver previously, uh, and I came to Texas Tech University to chair the Department of Communication Studies. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, how do you like those Red Raiders, and how are they going to do this year against, uh, you know, when, whenever, if and when they play uh, Texas Austin? The Longhorns. So, uh, Texas Tech has te Texas Tech has treated me well. Um, I'm a Red Raider fan now, and 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 um, you know, looking forward to seeing how this basketball season turns out. Well, I think it's going to be pretty good, so we are going to make sure that it's good. But anyhow, let's talk about the, the book. Tom, first of all, why did you write the book? And you know, if you just listen to the first part of the book, the title of the book, The Twitter Presidency, but then the second part says, Donald J. Trump and the Politics of White Rage. I mean, the subtitle is kind of interesting, Doctor. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there were kind of two motivations for writing the book. Often people who study communication, who are in my field, um, study one specific type of communication. So they study, for instance, public discourse um, and speeches. But one of the unique things about my training and background is that I study both communication, rhetoric, but I also study media. And so this president is sort of a unique intersection of both the way he speaks generally and then his preferred modality of communicating, which is Twitter. And he brings those two things together. So that was one impetus for writing the book is to be able to kind of explore that intersection. Uh, And then the second thing that really brought me to the book is I'm not a big fan of bullies, and he's a bully. No kidding. Now, let me ask you this, because um, I'll I'll be frank. I don't think, I mean, he uses Twitter a whole lot. Now, I look at the way, let's say, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uses Twitter. She is real savvy, and there's some intellect behind Mm -hmm. her tweets. I don't find a lot of intellect behind the president's tweets. What do you do? You agree with me with that first, or uh, you know, how is it that his tweets are so popular? So, I, I agree with your your basic premise that there's not a lot of intellect behind his tweets. It's actually sort of a characteristic of Twitter itself, but we, we can come back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so. What we, what we know from studying his speech and from studying his Twitter feed is that there is a really strong structural similarity between the way he speaks naturally mm-hmm. and the way he tweets. And so he speaks in very, very simple sentences, and that translates well on Twitter. The other thing that's really important here is, unlike pre- pretty much every president who's come before him after becoming elected or after being elected, he really had no interest in reaching an audience beyond his base. So his Twitter feed is really for a very small segment uh, of people. It, it's for that 38 to 48 percent of the public that supports him no matter what. Now, in, in having that support, I mean, well, he won the presidency based on the, the, um, the Electoral College, of course, but in, in, in concentrating on just that segment of the population, first of all, can he be an effective president? So this is, again, one of the things that distinguishes him from virtually all previous presidents. Most presidents tack to the center. They, they, they adjust their rhetoric after they're elected because they realize that being president is about governing, and governing is in part about compromise. But this president has no interest in compromise, and he really has no interest in governing. Uh, what he really wants to do is just be able to continue to build his brand and He's doing that um, by continually appealing to the same group of people and making sure that he always has their loyal support. But as a communication expert, especially since, uh, let's say, a whole lot of his uh, inconsistencies, a whole lot of his lies are being discovered, don't you think even for those die? I mean, in your book, you, you, you divided the uh, Trump supporter into two groups. So I think you called one the followers and one, I don't remember what you called the other ones, but why don't you first expand on that and then we'll move on from there. Sure. So we, we want to be clear in the book that we, we recognize that we, we, the first category is what we call Trump voters. Um, th- these are um, individuals who have no particular loyalty um, to Donald Trump. They voted for him, maybe in part because they didn't like the alternative, um, maybe because they thought he would shake up Washington, um, but they have no particular loyalty to his uh, brand of politics um, or to his ideas. The other category is what we call Trump followers. These are true believers. These are individuals for whom the president can do no wrong. It doesn't matter how many lies he tells, how, how blatantly those lies are revealed in the mainstream news media. Um, they accept his claim that the mainstream news media is fake news, which is, of course, patently ridiculous, but they accept that claim. And so the I, I, there's a 38% of the public that I really don't think there's much of anything that the president could do to lose the support of those individuals. Now, Dr. Rott, I mean, given, given that, uh, and give, given what you're saying, that there's nothing that he can do, and his main method of communication is Twitter. I want to kind of go off subject a little bit here. Is Twitter then a good thing, or is Twitter corrupting or democracy? Is Twitter... Uh, is Twitter uh, actually doing what we thought 
we wouldn't have wanted it to do. We thought it was a great method of communication, quick messages to get things done. But I mean, he's actually—I mean, he's actually messing with our democracy, is he? Absolutely. So, so here's the important point. What I like to tell people is that every mode of communication, every technology or medium of communication has its own built-in biases. As a consequence of having its own built-in biases, some technologies are very good at certain types of communication, and they're not very good at other types of communication. So that raises the question, what are the unique biases of Twitter? And after carefully studying the platform, here's what we know. It has three primary characteristics, or, or what I would call biases. It's biased toward simplicity, it's biased toward impulsivity, and it's biased toward incivility. All three of those characteristics um, make it an ideal platform for um, President Trump and the kinds of messages that he wants to send, but it makes it a really lousy platform um, to do national politics. And I really, social media generally, but Twitter specifically, is not a very helpful mode of communication for us to do politics. And I want to be clear, I'm not beating up on, on, on Twitter. Twitter is good at certain things. It probably is the most sophisticated emergency alert system ever invented. So if you need to get a message out very, very quickly to a wide uh, portion or swath of the public, Twitter is perfect for that. But for having thoughtful, sustained, engaged conversations around um, matters of, of foreign policy and national policy, Twitter is not the form we should be using. I, I noticed you said, uh, what are the benefits or the drawbacks of uh, conveying politics within 280 characters? It, yes, it is 280 characters now, no longer 140. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so what are the dangers? I mean, uh, what, are, what would you consider the real dangers of, of Twitter for the politician of tomorrow? I mean, uh, after acknowledging, of course, that Donald Trump is probably going to be the exception to quite a few rules. Right. Well, because of its three characteristics, so let's talk about what, what the implications of those, those characteristics are. Because it's limited to 280 characters, we know that all messages on Twitter are simple. And sometimes people misunderstand what I mean by that. Messages on Twitter can be clever, they can be funny, they can be witty, but they can't be complex. They can't be sophisticated. Um, an example that I like to compare it to, and, and this isn't my own example, comes from a, a famous media ecologist by the name of Neil Postman, um, where he talks in, in, in a very famous book called Amusing Ourselves to Death about um, the use of smoke signals. Um, smoke signals um, were an important form of communication at one point in history, but they didn't allow for complex communication. Right. You couldn't write philosophy using smoke signals. You can't write philosophy using Twitter. Um, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so it's 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 not good for it's not good for complex messages. And policy debates are complex messages, or they ought to be complex messages. Add to that the other characteristics of Twitter, um, the issue of impulsivity, yeah. which means that there's there's basically no barrier to entry. A person can, can tweet pretty much from anywhere at any time about anything they want. And so it, it, it's not a medium that allows for careful and thoughtful communication because it's not hard to do it. In fact, it's, it's really, really simple and easy to do it. And because it's so simple and easy to do it, a lot of time what's get, what gets communicated are messages that aren't very well thought out. And then finally is this characteristic of incivility. And I, and I want to be clear. I recognize that not all messages on Twitter are negative and not all messages on Twitter are, are uncivil. But here's what we know from the research. The messages on Twitter that are negatively toned travel further and faster. Why? And because of that... Um, it's in part because the medium itself, the technology or platform of Twitter, um, is a, a, a network that is particularly predisposed to mobilize affect. And if, if I were to just kind of define affect as simply as I can, I would describe it as public emotion. So most people are, understand, you know, when they have individual or personal emotions. But sometimes whole groups of people feel emotions. And this is where um, our interest in white rage comes in the book. Because we argue throughout the book that white rage is a 
It's an affect. It's a public emotion that's widely shared by a lot of Trump's followers. And Twitter was an especially good medium for mobilizing that affect. Now, um, the the next question that I was going to ask is moving away from Twitter proper and and asking why is it that uh, you immediately uh, turn to Donald Trump, J, uh, Donald J. Trump, and the politics of white rage. Uh, what, what is the connection there uh, that that actually allows Twitter to mobilize that group of folk in the in, in the fashion that you talk about? In other words, why is it that uh, it is so it is so effective for him to do? Um, it, it, at, the, at the heart of that is this issue of affect. So. Um, one of the things that we know from studying President Trump's rhetoric and his communication that makes him different from other presidents, not only the fact that he uses Twitter, that, that's one characteristic, but he emphasizes style over substance. And his unique rhetorical style, his way or his manner of communicating is specifically designed to stir up um, emotion, affect in other people. Um, And you see this at his campaign rallies. So when he was on the the, the campaign trail, um, he would hold these, you know, large, raucous campaign events, um, and and he would genuinely get people excited. And he fed off of their excitement. And that exchange of energy and affective emotion is what he's particularly good at. And one of the affects that he largely shares with his audience, because, again, affect is different than um, emotion is something that an individual feels. Affect is something that a public group feels. Oh, okay. And so one of the so so one of the affects that he's particularly good at mobilizing is um, anger that um, predominantly um, white people feel about um, what they perceive to be the decentering of whiteness, um, the decentering of the authority and power that comes both with whiteness and masculinity. Explain that. And I so think that's, the, that's an a, important concept that you did. So I think that deserves a bit more explanation. What exactly is that? So one of the things we know from um, our research is that Voters who voted for Trump were particularly angry. We also know demographically sort of who those voters were. They were, you know, they, demographically speaking, they were sort of overwhelmingly white, um, overwhelmingly male, um, and um, tended to not have a college education. So there was a pretty specific group that very, very strongly supported him. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that, but that's sort of the general demographic group. And one of the things that united that group was um, as our society has become a more global society, and notice how the president um, often speaks against globalism, right? Mm -hmm. Um, He he self-identifies as a nationalist. Um, But as our, our country has become more involved in global affairs, everybody in our country is exposed to cultural difference in a way that they were not in the past. And so clearly Trump and his followers are nostalgic for a time um, when we weren't exposed to cultural difference, where they, they, could, they could believe the myth of America that somehow we're superior to other people. But, but as you're exposed, for instance, just on your television, as you watch TV every night and you're exposed to global events and you're exposed to people who think, think things that are different than you, it's harder and harder to believe that you have access to some kind of um, unquestionable set of assumptions and ultimate truth. And so people are frustrated by that. Um, and the, the, they're, they're angry um, and they're projecting that anger onto racial others. Um, and the president picked up on that. Um, and he picked up on it and he ran with it. And so what he's done is he has demonized people who are ethnically different. Um, and he has mobilized the anger that many um, people who identify as nationalists feel about people who are ethnically and racially different. And he has managed to create a public affect, uh, uh, th- this emotion that's not individual but is shared by a wide group of people. Um, and he's tapped into it as, at his campaign rallies. He reinforces it in his speeches. And then he found the perfect platform to distribute that affect, um, which is Twitter. Because again, we know that, um, that uh, negatively toned messages travel further and faster. So it all is sort of forms this perfect um, storm for him. 
Okay, I want to I want to kind of move off a bit and explore something. I want to first tell you a little story. Uh, politics done right. One of the things that we do here is we try to put out the truth as the, the, the what we call the absolute truth, of course. But in in, in the process, um, one of our phrases is uh, when we unite. Appalachia, the ghettos, and the barrios, we would have won. Because the, con the, the, the theory that I work under is that the forces that are against the masses in general has nothing to do as well as, and I'm sure that you know that, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the other, but actually a small group of folks that you know use most people, in my humble opinion, as uh, commodities. And in order for them not to feel like commodities, instead of looking at who's making them commodities, what they do is they go ahead and try to create conflict among these different groups of people, conflicts among the others. That's the theory that we have. How comes it is so much harder to make that case on Twitter so that these people would have their eyes on the right ball instead of on each other? If you, uh, and first of all, tell me if you understand where I'm driving, where I'm going. Yeah, I, I think what you've just said is really compelling. L let me make a couple of comments on it. Um, so w we know that this president in particular has made, and he's not the first person to do this, um, either as president or a, a, as another public figure, but his rhetoric is extraordinarily divisive. So it, it, it is designed to kind of carve up people into various publics um, and maintain the loyalty of this, um, of this base of followers. Um, but it divides other people, and it creates um, division in society. And his rhetoric, we know, absolutely does that. But what we also know is that he's not alone in his efforts to do that. And in fact, we, we now know from really excellent investigative reporting that um, the Russian government was very heavily involved in this. I think when, when most people talk about or think about the role that the Russian government played in the, in the 2016 presidential election, they think that, um, that individuals just got online and promoted pro-Trump messages. That's actually not accurate. They did do that. But they were, what, what they did was actually far more insidious than that. They also got online and posed as Black Lives Matter activists. Right. Um, and so they were playing both sides of the political spectrum, trying to heighten tension, racial tensions in this country, trying to create division. So, so they, they, they weren't representing just one rhetoric. Um, they were pushing rhetoric on both sides of the political spectrum uh, as far apart as they possibly could. And I think a lot of people don't understand um, just how um, – O overwhelmingly um, well thought out mm -hmm. um, the, the the Russian attack on our 2016 election was. I in my mind, there's just no question whatsoever that the efforts um, undertaken by the Russian government um, swung the election. Well, do you remember that uh, Putin did say that he had a, a, wep a very a very big weapon to use, against, effective weapon to use against the Americans? And while they may have thought it was military, it just may have been controlling social media. It's amazing. He he actually said that. Yeah. Yes, and 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 we know that it's already begun for the 2020 election. So, um, j just in the past few days, um, Facebook closed a whole bunch of accounts that they've um, that they believe are somehow linked to Russia again. No. So, um, uh, uh, so no, social media. I was just going to say, and this is an important point. Social media is not where people should be getting their news and information. Part of the problem is that, um, as, an, as a public, that the American public is going to the wrong place to become informed, right? Um, and, and because of the structural biases of, of social media platforms like Twitter, which don't allow for the, the thoughtful and careful exploration of ideas, I mean, think about, the, think about just, for instance, the difference between the really detailed and in-depth conversation you and I are having right mm -hmm. now um, and a tweet, I mean, these things are miles apart. I mean, um, you can ask follow-up questions, right? Um, you can ask me to think about other things. Um, you can provide input and feedback that I'm then invited to respond to. So we create this, this dialectical relationship in the conversation that we're having. That's more likely to produce informative content than a 280-character tweet. Right. Now, um, you're a communication expert. Uh, you, I don't think people are going to leave the channels. I don't think they're going to leave social media. My question to you then is, 
um, what can we do? I mean, I, I, I think we have to build something. We have to do something to, uh, to, to, to mitigate this. I mean, a lot of, when I'm out there in the field, I'm, I'm also an activist. Many of us are activists, and this show is sort of a, uh, is sort of a, not an appendage, but, you know, sort of a central centralization of, of it. Um, one of the things that I tell people all the, of the times, to win people, you have to go where they are and not, what you, not where you want them to be. And that is the way you reach them. So my, my contention to you as far as social media is concerned is that that's where they are right now. Is there some model that you are thinking of that folks, in the commu- uh, uh, you know, folks that are studying this, I can say, well, if we cannot get them to go to the right sources of information, how can we do maybe what the Russians did, uh, not what the Russians did, but how do we mitigate what the Russians are doing to get folks to actually, um, on this platform, to be better informed? It's a, it's a great question. L- let me respond in a couple of ways. The first thing I want to be clear about is I'm not asking people to leave social media. Uh, what I'm urging people to do is to use social media for the things that it's really good at. Right? Social media uh, is wonderful. It's one of the best technologies we've ever con- created for connecting with other people who are not geographically near us. And so uh, I, my problem is not with social media. It's with I'm using social media to do things that other communication technologies do far better. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that other communication technologies do better than social media is um, uh, vet the news and vet the kind of information that we get in front of us. And so um, I think one of the most dangerous forms of rhetoric um, that comes out of the president right now is his attack on the mainstream news media. Oh, yeah. um, there, there, is, there is never a situation, never a situation, where it is accurate or meaningful to refer to the mainstream news media as fake news. Because by definition, fake news is propaganda. Fake news is Fake news exists. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And fake news is propaganda that is intentionally designed to mislead audiences. Um, The information that is produced by the mainstream news media, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or MSNBC, it doesn't matter which of those news outlets we're talking about. They're not engaged in propaganda. Right? They're trying to report the news. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that some of those outlets may not have particular political biases, mm-hmm. but it is very, very dangerous for us to associate political bias with fake news because fake news is not about political bias. It's about propaganda. And we had real fake news during the 2016 election, and it was all of the Internet activity on social media um, that the Russian government was churning out. That's fake news, right? And so it's extraordinarily dangerous um, for our president um, to refer to the mainstream news media as fake news, and even worse still, to call them the enemy of the people. In fact, when he does that in his rhetoric, he comes very, very close um, to, to engaging in propagandistic tactics himself. <laughs> I think he's already there, to put it bluntly. Now, um, let me ask you, um, I have two more questions for you. The first one is, what do you want to be the consequences of the folks who, who, who buy your book, who read your book? Or the outcomes? So, um, I, my hope, so we talk about a couple of things. You'll remember one of my central points um, in, in, as we've been chatting here is that the, the president s- seized on a, a public affect of white rage, right. um, th- this anger that, that, that many white people feel um, because they perceive that there's been a decentering of the authority and power of, of white masculinity. So he's been effective because he's been able to tap into that public affect. If we're going to combat the president and his rhetoric, um, we're not going to do it just through rational discourse. I'm not saying we shouldn't use rational discourse, but we need to tap into a public affect as well. And the end of the book is all about um, the politics of love. Um, 
there are two major types of political rhetoric in the world. There's rhetoric that defi- divides us, and there's rhetoric that unifies us. The president has been successful by choosing rhetoric that divides us. We desperately need to find leaders um, who employ and use rhetoric that unifies us and is rooted in love um, rather than hate. I mean, I, so that's I, one thing. I love that. I love that. I mean, I, I think uh-huh. it always, you know, I end, if you listen to some of my other shows, I always end with love. I mean, that is, that is one of the important things. Now, do's and don'ts for politicians on Twitter. And I want to add to that, do's and don'ts for activists on Twitter. Um, my advice to politicians on Twitter, and you mentioned at the, at, at the top of your show, I think, um, that 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 there's a new generation of politicians um, like uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Ocasio-Cortez, who, 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 yeah, who, who has sort of a, a more natural um, native instinct in relationship to Twitter. I mean, she's a digital native, mm-hmm. um, and she uses the platform in very interesting, I think, and provocative ways that, that are more positive. Um, um, so so I, it is possible to better use the medium. But what I don't think we should be doing is conducting national conversations via social media. Um, We need people to think about these. I'm far more of an advocate of shows like yours. Um, This is where the real dialogue can happen, um, where people can become informed about issues because they're not getting a 30-second soundbite. And people may have to actively um, seek that out. And so one of the things we can do is we can use platforms like Twitter to direct people to these outlets as opposed to um, letting Twitter replace these outlets. Well, we're... Speaking to Dr. Brian L. Ott, look, thank you. he's an award-winning scholar, professor, and author of The Twitter Presidency. You can get the, the book at Amazon. Of course, I have the direct link to the book at the blog site for politicsdoneright.com. Thank you so kindly for spending this time with us. I really wanted to hear about uh, your point of view, and I think uh, you didn't disappoint. Thank you so kindly for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. You have a wonderful day now. You too. Folks, uh, that was Dr. Brian L. Ott from Texas Tech University, a Red Raider. You know, you know, I just have to say that for the heck of it because I'm a longhorn. But anyhow, folks, we have some other serious things to discuss. I want to thank the professor for uh, that book. Uh, again, go ahead and check it out. If you go to politicsdoneright.com, uh, the, blogs, the blog for this show, you can actually go ahead and get the book. You can go ahead and get the book. We had some issues. I uh, bring in uh, Dr. Ott Im. Now, in the last 14 days or so, this has been the second person with that issue. I have to kind of figure out and see if there's something wrong with some con- with, with the guys at um, Wirecast to see what's happening. But anyhow, yesterday we had a great show at KPFT. I couldn't take any callers because, of course, at KPFT we were in fun drive mode, etc., etc., etc. But here I can take calls from you, and you know that number is uh, 646-716-5812. Again, that number is 646-716-5812, talking about insulin. Now, I mean, I, I, not insulin. I, I, I made a, a premise there, and I'm, I probably should play uh, the video as far as what uh, I discussed. So what I'm going to do, I think I made a seven-minute video, and I think it's important. So what I want to do... For those of you who didn't see the show yesterday, I, w- I want to play this. I hope I have it here on, on, online. I think I should still have it in my, my uh, area here. But before I go to that video, before I go to that video, you know what I always forget to do? I always forget to say, uh, well, you know, I need to remember that right now uh, we need to raise a little bit of funds. So therefore, please, folks, if you want to support Politics Done Right, go to patreon.com. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Politics Done Right. Remember, our membership starts at $1.99. It's pretty inexpensive and goes up if you want to be more helpful in making sure that we stay on air. Those people who become subscribers, of course, they get to read How to Make America Utopia Immediately for every chapter that I write, I throw it on there. I am on chapter three right now. Chapter one and two are already posted. 
But guess what? I've already placed this particular book online. And what book is that? As I see it, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. That book will illustrate all that you need to know about our current economy, folks. And not only that, why are we in the conditions that we're in today? It is so important for us to understand that this is by design in, in many, many, many different ways. And it's so hard to convey this. What I so again, if you if you would please go to patreon.com slash politics done right. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash politics done right and become a subscriber. There are a lot of other perks that you get. Like tonight. Tonight is gonna be our first what do I call it? Tonight will be our first video politics done right video meetup. It's gonna be tonight. Uh, for those of you that are members, I've already emailed you the passworded link to get into the meetup tonight where you can hit me up and tell me whatever you want to tell me. I have some issues that I want to discuss with you and you can tell me, Egberto, we want to cover this. Egberto, we don't like when you say that. Egberto, we don't know what you're saying here or there. It is all there for you. But what I want to do right now, my brothers and sisters, is play a very uh, play something that I, I cut up yesterday from our um from the show that I did yesterday. So let me put it in a good location up here. Let's see where I'm going to put it on the screen. I'm going to put it on the screen right here and I'll play it for you. And then we'll talk about it on the other end of the video. So here it goes. Our system is designed so that you will never be able to accumulate wealth because as soon as you're making it, it's taken away from you. And this is how it works, my brothers and sisters. The meme that my brother sent me said this. Humalock insulin, released in 1996, remains unchanged since its release. But its price increased 1,700% or more since then from $21 a vial to $275 a vial. An average one-year supply, that's 36 vials, has gone from $750 to $13,500 with zero changes to insulin. Gouging Americans for a life or death drug has consequences as noted at MedBedge today. One witness at the hearing, Paul Grant of Gloucester, Maine, described the process he went through to get insulin for his 13-year-old son who has had type 1 diabetes for four years. Grant noted that his employer doesn't provide health insurance, so he is paying for it himself through the Affordable Care Act's insurance marketplace, which is very expensive and very complicated. With his high deductible plan, Grant spent $2,500 on diabetes supplies for his son in 2017. He had been paying $300 for a 90-day supply of Humalog. That seemed like a lot until this past January when I called to refill my son's Humalog prescription. It was going from $300 to $900 for a 90-day supply. I kind of went into a panic mode, he said. He bought a 30-day supply at Walmart for $322 with a coupon until he could figure out a plan. Grant is now buying insulin from a Canadian pharmacy, which charges $295 for a 90-day supply, including shipping. For comparison, last week he looked up the price of a 90-day supply of Humalog at Express Scripts. It would cost him $1,500. Cory Booker, the guy everybody's loving right now as he's running as a Democrat, he voted to say Americans cannot go to Canada or any other country to bring the drugs in, even though they know the pharmaceuticals are terrorizing Americans with their pricing schemes. A recent survey found that one of four type 1 diabetics admitted to rationing insulin at least once due to cost in the past. Folks, this is what I call legalized murder. When there was no cost increase in product and you'd multiplied the price 1700 percent and in the process people have to go without and die that is legalized murder if i voluntarily cause your death it is at least involuntary manslaughter that's what pharmaceuticals are doing to americans every day for patents they don't even own this is a part of the blog i really want you to understand that was a story of insulin that was a story of companies being able to price the market here is what i want you to hear now it is easy to understand why the increase in price of drugs has life or death consequences in the immediacy what is not immediately apparent is how this mechanism 
mechanism this economic system by design is intended to rob you blind insulin is an old medicine over a hundred years old there is no patent on it worse as noted in the article above it was virtually placed in the public domain therefore it should be one of the cheapest drugs on the market there is a virtual monopoly in companies selling the product they determine the price the private sector determine how much they will force you to pay for a drug you must have. Pricing of any product in our economic system is based on a corrosive concept known as whatever the market will bear. Whatever the market will bear. And what will the market bear? Here's the thing, folks. Understand the concept of what the market will bear. All of your income plus your total credit wor credit worthness, how much you can borrow. That is what the market will bear. In other words, we won't allow you to accumulate wealth. We will take whatever we can from you because we have price and power. Sadly, the reality is that corporations whose fiduciary responsibility is to their shareholders and their huge undeserved salaries will keep raising prices until people are simply unable to afford what they are selling. If it is something they must have, Americans will spend up to their limit to get it. And what is their limit? All of their income plus all the credit they can get. All of your money, you cannot accumulate wealth. That is what our economic system does to you right now. The tenets of the current economic system are predicated on this behavior that effectively prevents us from saving it makes us entities that are nothing but conduits of our income our the regular people's income used to create the increasing wealth of a few those who determine prices the plutocrats you don't own a factory all those that own the means of production the private sector the corporatocracy they determine what the market will bear and the market will always bear your total income plus your credit worthiness remember that folks it's by design that you cannot accumulate wealth anytime you talk about those stockholders and the, the stock brokers that's not for you that is for the 10 to 20 percent yes some of you have a little shares here and a little share there those are peanuts they're there to take your wealth away. If you doubt me, look at your own bank account. In the past, when we made taxes very high on income after a million, there was no incentive for the legal robbery of the American people through predatory pricing because the ill-gotten gains were recycled back to the we the people via taxes. People always say, well, why have 90% tax rates on your income? Well, what it does is the reason that person in corporate America can make hundreds of thousands of dollars is they have price and power. And they price their products higher than needed so that that money gets funneled right back to them. They're take That high salary that they make is your money. Whenever a price goes up when the cost of the product doesn't, that is just a corporation saying, you know what? I want to make more money. I'm going to take it from you and give it to the shareholders. Remember, everything else stayed the same. Insulin didn't go up in price. They determined that they wanted more money for their shareholders and more profits for the executives. So what they did, they take the people who had zero price and power and they took that money understand the concept of how this economy functions it is designed whatever the market will bear remember those words as politicians on the take started reducing and eliminating taxes the results are clear our colleges are more expensive than they should schools are underfunded our infrastructure is deteriorating 80 percent of americans are living paycheck to paycheck but a few people get extremely wealthy not on their worth or work not on their worth not on their work, but their manipulation of prices, the pricing power, the pricing power, the means of production in the private sector, the pricing power. When unregulated, the pricing power comes for your money. The pricing power takes your disposable income. The pricing power makes sure you cannot win. The pricing power means you will never, ever be able to develop wealth. Okay, folks, I hope you got that. I hope you got that because it's all about price and power. It's all about taking your wealth. And it's not, you know, it's not that these guys really want to just take your wealth. It's not that, right? It's just that they are, they'll take whatever they have to take because they want it. You know what I mean? How much can you spend? How much, how much can you spend, you know? How much money must you have? But the good news is, guess what happened today? Uh, 
what's her name came out. I, I, I placed it in the blog earlier today. Uh, her name is Representative Jayapal has officially released the, the pre-log to Medicare for All. So we actually have some legislation that's been released for Medicare for All. So it is there. And according to Vox, uh, there is a person who um, did an analysis of it at Vox. It is pretty... Uh, and, you know, we were concerned when... when um, Jayapal started to do it, and the reason we were concerned is that she was going to do this behind closed doors. Uh, she said she wanted to meet with all the stakeholders to get this done, etc., etc., etc. Well, we were concerned because supposedly a lot of things were going to go away that uh, we had in HR 676, which you know is no longer that uh, that healthcare bill. HR 676 is something else now. But what we got, it seems like it's going to be a good bill and now it's all about selling it today wasn't supposed to be medicare for all today was supposed to be that little short clip that i that i played there but uh, what i want is if anybody calls in about that or ask let me check the to see if there's anybody asking any questions on that particular subject and if not i'm going to then go on to medicare for all and what we have to do going forward now so let me first go ahead and take a look at the uh the links here. Okay, let's see what people are saying. Vamos a ver lo que están diciendo. Okay, Kathleen Marin Morgan says, I'm on two medications that have been on the market for years, no generic. They cost $1,400 per month without insurance. I'd be screwed. I'd like to find out who developed them, NIH, and how much they cost to produce. But I mean, if they've been on the market for years, it is shameful that that's what we're looking at but that is what we that's what we have the price and power as i said in that video that i made uh, from my show yesterday the price and power give these guys unlimited uh, unlimited uh, rights to do what they want as far as pricing these drugs the only way there are two ways around and i had a conversation today with a uh, i went to the gym this morning as usual and there was a progressive guy that i was sitting or or, or on the treadmill next to him we were talking about uh, you know he's very progressive. We're talking about what needs to be done, and he agreed that you know the Donald Trump is bad. He agrees that Donald Trump's policies are bad, etc. But then I got a reaction that surprised me when I started to speak about well, you know, you really have to uh, increase taxes on the wealthy. And I think what happened is this guy was probably a wealthy guy, a liberal that's very wealthy, and this is where the the, the rubber meets the the, the tire, right? Uh, what, one of the tenets that I have out there is, you know, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, we don't want to have a lot of regulations as far as price controls and all those sort of things, right? And then I said, okay, there are some ways to mitigate price controls, right? Let's, let's look at it at a, as an example with these drugs. Let's say a company wants to make a whole lot of money, so they do what they do with insulin and they, they tr uh, multiply the price by 17 times. Okay, you did that. But if we had a 90%, a 90% tax on on your income after a certain level, there now is no longer an incentive for these people to jack prices way up because the marginal advantage that they get from that increase in vol uh, for that increase in price likely does not make up for the loss that they have for the people who will just die, not use it, or whatever. So there there are some reasons why very high incomes at high, or very high taxes on high incomes are not only necessary for redistribution, but for behavior. First of all, they don't deserve the high salaries that they have. The person who, look, you know what, you know what, you know what I think is very amusing? What does an insurance company do? An insurance company collects a whole lot of money from a lot of people and pay a bill. That's what they do. There is absolutely nothing else they're required to do. People say, oh, well, they manage risk. Well, they manage risk because they want a bifurcated market where they can have all healthy people that they take their premiums and don't pay out. But, you know, that's not what insurance really is. So here's the deal. Ultimately, their only purpose in life is to pay a bill. Now, you have engineers that build bridges you have engineers that design circuits that we are going to use forever and ever, amen. And these guys make 
you know, high five, low six figures, why the hell does a CEO of an insurance company make $13, 15000000 million a year? What, what is his value? What is it that we're paying him for? And I, I, I want to challenge Americans to ask themselves those types of questions. What is it that this person is doing that warrants them having that much more in income than somebody else building bridges or somebody else sewing a, you know, stitching you up or a nurse that is, or, a, or a, a, a physician practitioner? Why is it that they are worth that amount of money? And the, when you finally answer the question, you figure out they are not worth it at all. But remember what I said in that video, it's what the markets will bear. And so far, the markets are allowing these guys to collect a hell of a lot of money for doing absolutely nothing. I can imagine how the guy who is a CEO of an insurance company goes home and he probably pinches himself every day. My God, how can I be making $13 million for doing absolutely nothing? And any insurance person that wants to call me, any insurance CEO or hotshot executive in an insurance company wants to call me and discuss their worth, I am more than interested in, in not only discussing their worth, but contrasting their worth with my garbage man. I really would like to do that. As far as who is more, who works more for their money, and not only from a physical standpoint, but from a logical standpoint. Again, uh, so we have to start at, we have to stop believing that just because these guys have manipulated and created a system that affords them that kind of money that somehow they're worth it. The problem that we have in this country is not being able to assign worth appropriately. When the teachers go out there and ask for big raise, not big raises, modest raises, we have all kinds of people complaining about the teachers. We have all kinds of people complaining, right? But we hear about a CEO making $15 million and it's a one-day story and then we let it be. No, we shouldn't let it be. We should immediately say, find a way. How can we take away what he has not earned, what he hasn't really earned? And that is the kind of system we have to have. Now, going back to, to Medicare for All, we're going to have a lot of work to do. And there are a lot of entities out there with Medicare for All that, that their intent, like when, when Jayapal was out there talking about Medicare for All, a reporter, and you could see this was a plutocratic uh, lean-in reporter, uh, does our taxes going to increase? And... Her, you know, she didn't quite answer were taxes going to increase, but I want to remind you of one thing, okay? If you have a single-payer system, you save a lot of money because you don't have all the administrative costs from having doctors off. First of all, doctors bills, uh, the, the, the overhead that doctors are going to have to spend from dealing with one single pair, as opposed to having to have a staff to talk to Aetna, to talk to Blue Cross, to talk to all these different insurance companies, that's gone. So they can get rid of all those people, which means if they get rid of all those people, they can charge you a hell of a lot less money to come for a doctor visit. Second, uh, since the doctors only have to go, uh, since it's just one entity, we're talking about a risk pool that is the entire country. Right now, every single in insurance company is trying to manage what they call a risk pool, right? Uh, they can't do it legal enough, but they try to get healthy people. They try to advertise in areas they think that there are more healthy people in those areas so that that's the group of folk that they get. There are, but those who are going to tell you, your insurance, or rather your, your health care, there, there are two things that they're, they're going to work against right now. The Plutocras is putting out two narratives. The first narrative is that your taxes are going to go up. That is true. Your taxes are going to go up, but you ain't got no premiums anymore which means your outlay out of your pocket is going to be quite a bit less. Remember that. Your, your, your taxes go up, but there are no health care premium, no insurance premiums, for you, no medical insurance premiums for you to pay anymore. Numero dos, you are going to not, you won't have deductibles, you won't have co-pays, you won't have any of that. Then the next scare tactic that they want to use is, oh, but you're going to lose your private insurance. What the hell is private insurance good for if you have a huge deductible and you have a whole lot of co-pays? All of that is gone. 
So how can your private insurance be better than what we're giving you because we take out a whole lot of that cost? Don't let them scare you into not supporting Medicare for all. We cannot allow that to happen. We must not allow that to happen. Medicare for all, we're going to go through a whole lot of kinks in the beginning, but ultimately speaking, that is where we must be. And that is what we have to fight for. And the thing about it is don't let centrist Democrats change the narrative. Do not allow centrist Democrats to, to change the narrative. Do not allow them to buy into the, um, the, the fear that Republicans are going to try to put upon them. Oh, but you know it's going to be a high cost. Oh, but you know this. Oh, but you know that. Do not allow that, my brothers and my sisters, at all. That is what they're intent on doing. Anyhow, we had a, a, a pro, uh, you know, it was great having Dr. Ott on the show today. I'm just sorry we couldn't get the live feed in. I am going to have to do some research as to why some people come in and some don't. But that's okay. We'll take care of that. But before I go, I have to do my ask one more time. Please go ahead and go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics done right. Please consider being a supporter of politics done right. We do a whole lot of work. We were, in fact, we're going to be in Austin on Monday, because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to do the broadcast from the bus if we're on the bus or do the broadcast from wherever we are for Politics and Right. I'm not quite canceling the broadcast from Monday, but we are going to Austin, Texas to try to force these guys into supporting the Medicaid expansion to the Affordable Care Act. Over 2,000 Texans are dying every year because they don't have access to health care. It is shameful on a big state. We are the state with the most uninsured in the entire country, Texas is. The state with the most uninsured. They like to sell themselves. We like to sell Texas as this wonderful place. But you turn to every, to every fourth person you see, and that is somebody without health care. Please go ahead and go to patreon.com slash politics and right. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics and right. Please support this program. We need Thousands of low-cost supporters. I mean, it, it is... Look. This is... This... I don't know what that is all about. This is like very... Uh, w we put a lot into Politics Done Right. We put a lot into our equipment. We put a lot into traveling. We put a lot into producing the programs, processing the programs... Uh, writing the blogs. And right now, it is a grand total for Politics Done Right of me. And I really need some help, but I can't get help until we get Politics Done Right in a self-sustaining modal. Right now, I have been savaging retirement, and it's almost terminado. My expectation is that we are going to support progressive media. That is my hope. My hope is that we are going to see the value in being able to, I don't like to use educate because it sounds a bit too presumptuous, but to inform folks on how to do, how to not vote against their own interests. That's one of the goals of this program. The goal of this program is to inform. The goal of this program is to, to make sure folks exactly know what's going on and telling them in the, uh, telling them with the narrative, uh, with the true narrative as opposed to the false narrative of, of what you're going to get out there. So again, subscribers of the show, patreon.com slash politics then right, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics then right. Uh, if you don't want to be a subscriber but you want to contribute, please just go to politicsthenright.com and click on the PayPal button, donate, do donate to the to show. Let's get these things uh, really uh, taken care of and going. Again, for those of you, we have the bumper sticker. We're going to have some cups pretty soon. We have, the, uh, we have the books. By the way, we have another book there. As I see it, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right Wing Doom. If you want to learn all that we talk about, want to learn a whole lot of the intricacies of this economy in an easy-to-understand manner that anybody can understand, you can go ahead and read the book online by just becoming a subscriber. So please go to patreon.com slash politics then right. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics then right. This is the end of the show. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am out.
Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four.